welcome. Thanks for dropping in. Hope you had a good week last week and are getting this one off to a good start. Uh, may I suggest that uh, getting into the Word of God like we're going to be doing here in a few minutes is certainly a great way to start a week. Let me take a minute, uh, if you will, to share with you where we are in studying God's Word here on Truth Seekers and uh, what lies ahead for the next uh, few weeks and where we're headed after that, Lord willing. Uh, if you've been with me on these videos over the last year since COVID-19 wreaked havoc on so many churches about a year ago and upon our lives, actually, but you'll remember that Truth Seekers is a Bible study at the First Southern Baptist Church in Guthrie, Oklahoma, which uh, Lynn Crawford and I lead. Uh, we were shut down due to COVID uh, for about two months. Um, I think it was nine weeks to be exact from March the 29th through, uh, I believe it was May the 31st. And that's when we resumed meeting. But uh, because so many of you were watching these videos who are not members of our congregation and churches, other churches you belong to, we decided to keep video, video, videoing these studies uh, until either the Lord uh, directs us otherwise or until interest waned to nothing. So when we started videoing, uh, we were about midway through an 11 week study of the Apostle Peter. I don't know how many uh, of you watching today were with us back then or not, but then you may recall we moved to the Old Testament book of Judges and did a 10 week study on Gideon. We all are familiar with Gideon and you remember he's the, the weak man that God had to make strong in order to be able to use him. And after that, we continued in the book of Judges with a, a fun story. I, at least it was for me. I sure enjoyed studying Samson. And that was an 18-week study uh, from the first part of August to nearly the end of November. And you remember the crux of that was that uh, Samson was a strong man that God had to make weak in order to use him. So two men unusual men uh, at opposite ends of the spectrum that God used in mighty ways. Uh, they're even in the Hebrews 11 hall of fame for the faith people. Uh, what a teaching and what a set of lessons for us even today. Um, uh, get in if you're like get in if you're uh, weak or haven't been a faithful follower of Christ Jesus in the past. Never fear, God uh, can and will use you if you surrender to him and make yourself available to him. Or if you're on the other end of the strength scale and you're a little bit more self-centered, a uh, little stronger willed, a little more hard-headed, uh, but you're still chosen of God, you're a believer, be ready because if you are his, he'll break you in order to use you. So uh, those were two great studies, or at least I certainly enjoyed them. And, and, uh, I hope I pass that way again, that I'll get to study those again uh, in depth like we did. We really uh, plowed deep on those two men. Well, next, uh, we came to the holiday season, and we had a Thanksgiving lesson or study or two, and then we did a three-part Christmas study, uh, the virgin birth. You might remember that. And uh, why did God send Jesus to us, and why did Jesus agree to come? Um, had a lot of feedback from those uh, studies as well. And then in early January, we started uh, viewing um, in our Truth Seekers Bible study group, Del Tackett's uh, Focus on the Family, uh, their Truth Project. Uh, it's a 13-part, 12-week video series that focuses on the truth. In other words, is there absolute truth? And if so, how do you know it? And where do we get it? And those kind of things. And you can find those videos on YouTube for free. And uh, I encourage you to even consider purchasing them because if you're like me, every time I watch them, I learn something new. And they're just one of the most magnificent set of videos that I've ever uh, watched or studied with regard to biblical truths. But uh, while we're letting Dale Tackett do the teaching during these 12 weeks, which we're kind of right in the middle of right now, <clears throat> I've been bringing you snippets each week or short studies or or uh, teasers, if you will, from various passages 
that uh, I and hopefully you come across in our daily Bible readings of God's Word. And uh, then I typically give a short synopsis, a recap of the Truth Project video that we watched from the week before, and then a quick preview of next week's Truth Project video. And we're going to continue doing that for six or seven more weeks until probably the middle of April when we'll be finished and wrap up with the Truth Project. And after that, and this is what I wanted to share with you so you can be looking forward to it and hopefully even be reading ahead because uh, I hope you'll continue dropping in uh, as we start studying uh, in great detail after we finish the Truth Project, the parables that Jesus gave us in the Gospels. Um, I'm already working uh, in pre preparation for those studies and I look forward to sharing and studying and, and learning from them with you as we go through those. So that's an overview of where we've been, where we are, and where we're headed. Uh, all subject to the Lord's will, of course. Um, well, um, before we get started looking at the scriptures, let me uh, pray for us as we begin uh, looking in God's word today. So, Father, uh, indeed, we thank you for your word uh, that you've so graciously provided us. Uh, we don't um, have to wonder or guess who you are or what you think and, and what uh, is your nature. You tell us plainly and clearly and unequivocally and, and you give us the truth, who you are and how we are uh, to commune with you, how we can be saved into eternal life and how you love us and uh, um, how you're patient with us and how you're merciful uh, with us and, and you're so compassionate and forgiving. All that's in your word and we thank you for that. And we thank you for the, the fact that it lasts forever and it never will change as, as you never change. So thank you, Lord God Almighty, uh, that uh, we can call you our Heavenly Father. In your Son's name, Christ Jesus our Savior, we pray these things. Amen. Well, thank you for joining um, me again, and um, let's now look at some things that I came across this last week, and hopefully you uh, came across them of your own. Um, from the Old Testament standpoint, this past week, uh, we've been in the book of Leviticus almost all week, um, and I want to say a few things about this book, Leviticus. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, it's the third book in the Bible, part of the Pentateuch, the first five books. It was written by Moses. But I want to give you just an, a general overview. You know, it may seem like a strange book uh, of the Bible to us and, and maybe seem so inapplicable uh, to us today. As I said, it was penned by Moses uh, at God's, of course, direction and his leading. But it was written by Moses to God's people, the Israelites, the Hebrews, or we know of them as the Jews. All of those are correct, Israelites, Hebrews, and Jews. And I say it's strange because when you read it, it's a little bit shocking. Uh, they almost need to put a mature uh, rated um, um, on it. Um, I, as you know, I'm going through a Bible for my granddaughter who's 11 this year. And I can't help but think when I read through Leviticus, I think, I wonder what she's going to think if she reads this. Uh, there's much discussion about leprosy. There's uh, about menstrual periods, um, rape and the punishment that goes along with that about incest, um, you name it, about the death penalty, um, blood sacrifices, uh, idolatry. Um, it's, just, it's just an amazing book in, about the prohibiting of human sacrifices to Molech and, and other things. Uh, the whole book takes place uh, at the foot of Mount Sinai, uh, actually in the tabernacle, but that was the location of it. And, you know, Mount Sinai is, is in the wilderness uh, somewhere uh, in, in Egypt. And um, it's uh, where God gave the Jews the law, the Mosaic law, which, of course, includes the Ten Commandments, um, but much more. And this was the law that the Jews, that God instructed them to live by. And it was for them. And it, was, it wasn't for us. Uh, it isn't for us today. Uh, that changed with the coming of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. Uh, that changed with the cross, with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Um, but when the book of Leviticus um, 
was written, uh, it was certainly important to them. And I believe it's still very, very important to us because here's why. It reveals so much to us about God himself, his nature, his characteristics, who he is, and what he wants and expects from us. Um, it's a book that points us to God's holiness and how to worship him. Uh, many Bible scholars, and I was shocked to find this uh, years ago when I started really intensely studying God's word, but many Bible scholars, including J. Vernon McGee, believe it's one of the most important books in the Bible for several reasons, uh, God's holiness and how to worship and so forth. Uh, but maybe most important, at least to me, as I go through it each year, it points us to our Savior, Christ. Um, the reason that Jesus had to suffer and die for us, but praise God, uh, God raised him uh, from the dead and uh, resurrected and he's alive today and the tomb is empty. But Leviticus also basically, uh, there's so much there. It even, I noticed this year, I thought about it, that it explains the Ten Commandments. It just doesn't give them to us. It applies them to through the Israelites' lives. Uh, and we can take that same thing about how to apply it to our lives. Um, and uh, But all in all, Leviticus shows us that God is holy and just and righteous. And it's so vivid in its description of what is holy and what is just and what is right that it shows us in vivid color um, why whatever God did in the Old Testament, there was a reason for it. Uh, we see the righteousness side of God there in the book of Leviticus. And I think it's always important for us to balance that equally because over in the New Testament, we should probably, every time we read Leviticus, read chapters 9 and 10 of Hebrews in the New Testament. It gives us the counterbalance to that because while we see the righteous, just side of God in Leviticus, we see the merciful side of God over in Hebrews 9 and 10. Uh, so I think they should probably be read in tandem, one then the other and, and vice versa to get the proper perspective. Uh, granted, Leviticus is, is really a hard book to read. It's, it's reflective of a time of great wickedness and immorality and evil. And it causes us to be thankful uh, for the day and the time that we live in today where we see God's mercy so evident uh, as compared to those evil and wicked times that we read about in uh, Leviticus. But don't be lulled to sleep. It's a warning to us, I believe, uh, because I believe we're quickly reapproaching those times again with our, in our world today and in society. Uh, but you read Leviticus from the perspective of how our times are really regressing back to them. It, it, it will be a very enlightening and educational thing for us. You know, we, we've lived in the shadow of our forefathers and our grandparents and our great grandparents who were certainly, um, on the whole, in my opinion, very uh, godly people and certainly um, more moral than we are today. Uh, we truly were, as I've said before, we were a nation, a Christian nation, and founded upon the Bible. You can see evidence of, of, of Judeo-Christianity and the Constitution, uh, the, the, uh, the Declaration of Independence, and on and on. Well, all that long-winded and opinionated background, um, just to set the stage, because we're you've been reading Leviticus probably, and, and I, we're going to have some verses I want to look at uh, from there. Um, the first one that I wanted to cover with you, um, it, it points out how comprehensive and how complete um, God's Word is. I'm amazed at all of the subjects that we see in Scripture. It covers everything, almost every subject. Um, how about Proverbs 10, uh, 4 and 5 that we would have read this week if you're reading from the same daily Bible I am? or In fact, many of them would have had it, whether it's this one or not, would have had this in it this week. Um, and it's about slothfulness and laziness. Um, it's just amazing. Whatever you want, you can find it in the Bible. It's just, it's incredible. But here's what verses four and five of Proverbs 10 says. It says, 
He who has a slack hand becomes poor, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a wise son. He who sleeps in harvest is a son who causes shame. So all that, uh, those two verses, uh, lets us know that uh, uh, God knows that laziness hurts us and uh, it, deplete, it displeases him. It stops us from being what God created us to be, uh, and hence from receiving God's best blessings. Uh, so it teaches us that uh, uh, God uh, understands and wants us to understand that laziness leads to problems. It creates stress and pressure on us and may cause us to even lose our job. Uh, it leads to poverty. So again, we see God's wisdom and truth on display uh, at the same time. And just these two verses, it just, we're in our reading this week and it, it just stuck out to me. The next one I wanted to cover with you is over in Leviticus chapter 19. You know, God's word even provides for the poor and those in need too. And uh, let's look at uh, Leviticus 19, uh, 10 and 11. Um, it says, when you reap the harvest of your land, and this is God instructing Moses to instruct the Israelites. So God, in fact, I think I read about 15 times this week that each of the chapters in Leviticus start out, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, wow, what a relationship God had, uh, and Moses had with God. But this is God instructing Moses. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. In other words, don't pick everything up. Um, and you shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord, your God. Well, you know what this is? This is God's welfare plan. Before the government took care of of the poor and needy and downtrodden people. God already had it under control. Um, he had his people living with them in mind. Um, and this shows us that God has a special concern uh, for poor people, for people that are handicapped, that, for the downtrodden. And uh, we, of course, see this spill over in the New Testament, don't we? It spills over in spades over there. Uh, think of what Jesus uh, said when he first started his ministry there, when he was reading from Isaiah in the synagogue, and, and uh, in Luke 4, 18, I've written it down. Uh, he said, the spirit of Yahweh God is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. God loves the poor people. In fact, over in uh, Luke 5, um, when Jesus was being criticized after Matthew had been called uh, the tax collector and he'd been called as an apostle um, and you know Matt, tax collectors were despised in verses uh, 30 and 31 let me listen to what Jesus said but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to uh, their sect complained to Jesus' disciples why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners saying it very mockingly or sarcastically. And Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So God cares for the downtrodden and the poor. And I'm thankful for that, aren't you? Then we had uh, in Psalm 27, verse eight this week, which says, uh, Uh, when you said, referring to God, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. You know, God wants us to uh, show more, or God wants to show more of himself to us every day. And he wants a living, vibrant, and uh, a one-on-one -on -one relationship with, with each of us. And we can do that by being in his word, reading the Bible. And he has given us the Holy Spirit to help us interpret his word. And he wants us to meditate on his word so we can apply it to our lives. 
just read the promises that God has made to us in Scripture and His Word. We should ask Him to remind us of how He's already worked in our lives and how He's been there for us, giving us life, sustaining us, protecting us, and giving us His wisdom. Well, I noted again uh, in Leviticus chapter 22, verse 21, and we've already seen it many times uh, as we've read Leviticus, that God required the Israelites when they brought sacrifices and offerings to the tabernacle and eventually to the temple after they set, built the temple in the promised land, that they were required there in the Old Testament to bring sacrifices and offerings that were perfect, without blemish, without defect. And Leviticus 22, verse 21 says, it must be perfect, referring to the uh, what was being offered, to be accepted, there shall be no defect in it. Well, um, what's the teaching in that for us? I mean, what's that all about? Well, what it was doing, it was appointing the Israelites to Christ Jesus, who was the perfect sacrifice, who offered himself upon the cross to save you and me from our sins and, and from the penalty of sin. And you remember Jesus was the perfect sacrifice, uh, the sacrificial lamb uh, without defect, without sin. In fact, last week, I think it was, we looked at, at a passage from the New Testament where Pilate declared Jesus when he was on trial, not guilty and innocent three times. So question, how, how do we know what uh, we as believers uh, offer on this side of the cross because we don't have offerings on this side. We don't have a temple or a tabernacle to, 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 uh, to, uh, to sacrifice to. So how do we as believers today uh, offer and make a sacrifice to the Lord? Well, Romans 12, 1 will be familiar to many of you. It says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercy of God, mercies of God to present your, your bodies as living sacrifices and holy sacrifices to the Lord. And if we were to read on in verse two there, chapter 12 of Romans, it says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds through Christ Jesus. Well, the bottom line, God wants us to give our best to him, not the leftovers. We tell the Lord what he really means to us by uh, how much of us we give to him. And uh, that steps on my toes quite often. And uh, he wants uh, most of all our hearts. He wants um, to have that relationship. And you know what, in return that uh, he gives us, he gives us himself. Pretty good deal, huh? <laughs> well, finally, I want to uh, bring your attention Psalm 27, verse 14. It says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. God promises that uh, he acts on our behalf and has our very best interests in mind when we wait on him. You can read about that over in Isaiah chapter 64. But we often run ahead of God, don't we? And uh, try to fix things on our own or orchestrate our lives without him because we're impatient. But if we wait on God, remember, he's divine. He's sovereign. He's omnipotent, they say, and will do and give us much more than we can ever do or give ourselves. Well, I hope this has been encouraging to you. Uh, God is our strength and he is our hope. You can take that to the bank. And before we close, let me encourage you to uh, watch lesson six this week of The Truth Project. It's titled, History, Whose Story? It's absolutely one, if not uh, my most favorite of the uh, 12 videos. Um, and I, I don't know how you'll see it. It may not be one of your favorites. It's certainly one of mine. So I really encourage you, if you, if you can, to watch it. Uh, and I don't know that it's ever been more applicable than it is today. You know, these videos were released in 2006, and, <laughs> and we, do, we need this one about history today. Uh, my favorite part is the, is the educating us on how 
history is being revised and uh, it's going on right under our noses and uh, before our very eyes, isn't it? Well, um, we'll look at this week in, in, in video lesson six, uh, the Mayflower Compact. Been a long time since you thought you even thought about the Mayflower Compact, huh? And you'll be amazed what it really says, uh, as opposed to what our textbooks tell us that it says. Uh, he'll quote Karl Marx, uh, Dale Will, and, and he, a quote that I like that he uses, a people without a heritage are easily persuaded, as he talks about history. And Dale will point out and make a case for this sad truth. Not only do we forget what we should remember, but we tend to remember what we should forget. Well, come back next week and we'll discuss that and uh, we'll look at some more of God's uh, precious word. In the meantime, be safe, be in God, be in his word, and walk with our Lord Jesus. Good day.